Robert. Um, I, uh, as I said, I was saying earlier that I have no idea whether what I have to share will be of interest or use. Uh, I taught philosophy to uh, uh, high school uh, seniors, 18, 17, 18 year olds. And so I approach the history of philosophy from that perspective. And uh, I teach philosophy sort of as a part of my ethical culture work to general audiences. So it's not an academic talk. Uh, I'm offering more of a collection of thoughts that I use in my work. Um, uh, I, when I tell people uh, I'm an existentialist, um, usually I get uh, either blank stares or uh, they look at me with suspicion or interest, sometimes with pity. But um, I've thought a lot about my existentialist philosophy recently because of the pandemic, uh, heightening my sense of my own mortality. Um, climate change recently in the United States is uh, becoming more and more of a horror story. And, um, uh, you know, I think people, I come from a progressive position, um, rather embarrassed about the leadership of my country's position on climate change. but. It's clearer and clearer to me that uh, we are putting at risk our lives. The biosphere itself is threatened. And so um, these elements of the pandemic and climate change has heightened my existentialism. So uh, I'm gonna just sort of go over some of what I find I'm processing in this situation and how I'm using my philosophy to do that. Um, quite often I'll start my philosophy classes by talking about Kierkegaard as being, many people consider him the, the first existentialist. Uh, when he talks about facing death, he says it's the ultimate leveling reality of life. Uh, that uh, That's one thing that is universal, that our existence will disappear uh, at some point in the eternity that stretches in front of us. Um, I often share with my students stories of Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, where his characters contemplate their non-existence. Um, and he stresses how universal that experience is. Uh, death being an immovable barrier that we're never going to get past, that attracts us but denies us at the same time. Um, and it frames our lives. Uh, I, I often share the story of Juan Mirabal in uh, short story, The Wall, who is condemned to die by firing squad. And he imagines the wall behind him as the guns are pointing at him and he he laments his fate he says uh, somebody will holler aim and i'll see eight rifles pointing at me i'll think how i'd like to get inside the wall i push against it with my back every ounce of strength i have but the wall stays like a nightmare i can imagine that i only know I, I, I wish you only knew how well I can imagine it, end quote. Um, his partner, Simone de Beauvoir, I think had a slightly healthier approach to mortality. Uh, uh, she was less brooding. She promoted a healthier existential attitude. She, she wrote, it is useless to try to integrate life and death and to behave rationally in the presence of something that is not rational. Each must manage well as he can to, in the atonement of feelings. Um, in, a article, in an essay she wrote called The Ambiguity, uh, The Ethics of Ambiguity, she writes, today we are having a hard time living because we're so bent on outwitting death, outwitting death. Now, I don't try to outwit death. Uh, I think that um, it is the ultimate reality I try to process. Um, I am a, a religious humanist. Uh, I'm non-theist. I'm an atheist. But I do believe that um, the ultimate reality is that life is final. Uh, uh, death ends it. Uh, it is not evil. I don't see uh, uh, some sort of metaphysical good and evil wrapped up in life and death. But it does infuse my life. Um, I taught for 25 years, and there was an educational writer by the name of Howard Gardner who talked about different forms of intelligences that students learn about the world in different ways, including um, linguistic or mathematical or kinesthetic. And 
he was thinking about adding a new category of intelligences that he called existential intelligence. Uh, and uh, he writes about how people who have this sort of intelligence are curious about life and death and uh, ultimate realities. And I began to think about how philosophers must have this natural existential intelligence. Uh, Socrates, uh, Plato wrote that Socrates said that, quote, ordinary people seem not to realize that those who really apply themselves in the right way to philosophy are directly and of their own accord preparing themselves for dying and death. The person that uh, founded ethical culture, which is a tradition that I'm involved with, uh, also wrote about that. He said, the frank facing of death has the effect of sifting out the true values of life from the false, the things that are worthwhile from the things that are not worthwhile, the things that are related to the highest ends and those related to lower partial ends. So as I analyze existentialism with my students, I try to bring clear some of the more sort of uh, basics about existentialism. So I talk about the three A's, uh, abandonment, anguish, absurdity. Um, and I talk about how Sartre says that abandonment describes the modern human condition, especially for atheists. Uh, for most of us, it's represented in the condition of having been abandoned by God. Uh, the growing atheism of last century, along with uh, the wars, World War I, World War II, and alienation, convinced many people that God was dead. Nietzsche writes about this. He blamed human consciousness for the death of God, for this murder. Uh, uh, Nietzsche wrote, uh, whither is God? Where is God? I shall tell you. We have killed him. You and I. All of us are his murderers. Do we not hear anything yet of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Do we not smell anything yet of God's decomposition? God too decomposes. God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. All existentialists, I think, agree that abandonment means that we are no longer certain. Uh, certainty has left us with God. Uh, between our consciousness and everything else is a huge, huge chasm of doubt. Uh, we stand in solitude at, at the abyss, Kierkegaard talks about, and we have to make any leap by ourselves. We don't have a guide anymore. There are no excuses. And in this way, we are alone. We've been abandoned. That to me is wrapped up in anguish uh, that we appreciate that we have to choose. That's where the anguish lies. The anguish is not in that we've been abandoned by God. The anguish is that we still have to make a choice. And um, students are quick to understand the anguish of Abraham, the story that Sartre speaks about where Abraham is apparently ordered by God to kill his son. And on the surface, a lot of people say, well, the anguish is that he is ordered by God to kill his son, but that's not the anguish. Clearly the anguish is that he doesn't know if that is God or not. The anguish is that he has to make a choice as to whether to believe in that God and kill his son. And perhaps if within that context, within that metaphysics, he will, his son will be in a better place in heaven and he will be there with his son eventually and reunited. But the anguish is that what if that is not God? What if that is the devil? We can't know for sure. And so he has to be certain, uh, but he can't be because God is no longer guaranteeing it. So in the context of, of having to make that choice, only he can make that choice and he could be wrong. Um, so that he is small in stature, he's limited in knowledge, but he has to decide to believe and accept this ultimate responsibility. And the same is true for every decision you and I make. And uh, even if we uh, decide to consult a god or an expert or a friend, uh, we have to decide which expert to go to, who to ask, uh, and, and then what to decide. And that's where the anguish lies. But the absurdity, I think, is the most misunderstood, especially by my students. Um, abandonment and anguish um, is, is one thing, but absurdity is really more about when our intentions don't match reality. 
Abraham thinks he's killing his son for some divine purpose uh, by an all-powerful God. But if there is no purpose and there is no God, then the intention clashes with the reality. Uh, Camus offers a, a, a more down-to-earth example. He says, if I see a man armed only with a sword attack a group arm of, of machine guns, I should consider his act to be absurd but it is solely by virtue of the disproportion between the intention and the reality he will encounter. Of the contradiction I notice between his true strength and the aim he has in view. So the, it's the disproportion between the intention and the reality that causes the absurdity. Um, I think so often people think of the absurdity as the meaninglessness of reality. The singular fact of the meaninglessness of reality, though, um, where there's no necessity, no reason, no way for the no 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 reason for the th the fact that things are as they are, and the fact that reality could be ar arranged differently, and it wouldn't matter. That single fact is not the absurdity. Um, Pascal, Blaise Pascal said. He epitomized that idea, that single meaninglessness. He says, when I consider the short duration of my life, swallowed up in the eternity before and after, the little space that I fill, and even see engulfed in the infinite immensity of space of which I am ignorant, of which knows me not, I am frightened and astonished at being here and not there, now rather than then. For Pascal, the meaninglessness was just one fact, and the absurdity was that. But for me and for, I think, the existentials that I read, that's not absurdity. The lack of objective meaning is not absurd. For me, the absurd arises between the clash of reality and intention, the clash between the meaninglessness of reality and my insistence on meaning. Uh, Camus says that, it lies in neither the elements compared, it's born of their confrontation. So that meaninglessness confronts our quest for meaning. And that's how Camus, I think, explains what absurdity is. Um, it does not point towards self-extinction. Uh, Camus says the absurd is not a threat to human life, but a creation of it. Only by living our life does the absurd live. So the issue is not, according to Camus, whether the absurd leads to suicide, but rather the absurd is only possible if we choose to live. So Camus urges us to keep the absurd alive. He says, living an experience, a particular fate, is accepting it fully. Now, no one will live this fate knowing it to be absurd unless he does everything to keep before him the absurd brought to light by consciousness. Negating one of the terms of the opposition on which he lives is to elude the problem. The theme of permanent revolution is carried into individual experience because living is keeping the absurd alive. He talks about the fact that suicide settles the absurd. He says that it engulfs the absurd in the same death. But he says, I know to keep alive the absurd, it cannot be settled. It escapes suicide to the extent that it is simultaneously awareness and rejection of death. That revolt gives life its majesty. Spread out over the whole of a life, that revolt restores its mag to majesty that of life. To a man devoid of blinders, there's no finer sight than that of intelligence at grips with a reality that transcends it. Enough of the background of existentialism right now. Um, but for me, the idea of consciousness wrestling with what's beyond it is heroic. I think it's a heroic thing to do. And so in these times where we have the pandemic, we have climate change, I think we need to also embrace the absurdity of our existence.
which is a revolt against our own mortality. And so I steer people towards Viktor Frankl. Many of you, I'm sure, have read this existentialist psychoanalysis who worked for many people who were deeply mired in darkness. Many of the survivors of the Holocaust were his clients. And he didn't offer specific solutions, but he did ask people to lean into the darkness of their existence and not to try to escape it, but to see the dark and the lightness as part of their whole existence. Part of his uh, solution was called logotherapy, therapy of the whole. And he said that we, he basically focused on the fact that there are certain limitations to life that we cannot choose. Uh, our, our own mortal existence is one of them. Uh, and we can't change that, but we can change how we approach that limitation, how we approach the fragility of our life. Um, I know that when this pandemic first hit, uh, I felt a disorientation and a fear that I hadn't felt often. Um, it, uh, it, it was the same feeling that I've been getting when I read more and more environmental work about how dire our situation is. And so I linked it together with this existential awareness of our own mortality. Um, I recently read a book that I urged you to read called The Uninhabitable Earth. And by the way, well, by the way Robert, I can um, uh, send the transcript for this talk with all the references so people can, can look at it if they want. But the, this book called The Uninhabitable Earth by David Wallace Wells was sort of a slap in the face to a lot of Americans who keep denying climate change because of, well, we'll get into that later. But one of the things that he teaches us is just how dire the situation is and how quickly climate change has been occurring. One of the facts he shares is that half of the carbon that has been shared into the environment, into the atmosphere, has occurred in the last 30 years, which is amazing. He talks about the fact that 10,000 people a day are dying of air pollution. Uh, people are dying of hypothermia at a higher rate. I mean, Europe experienced a heat wave last year. Uh, I was in southern France, so I escaped the worst of it because it was in primarily northern France. But 1,500 people died of hypothermia that wouldn't have died. Um, uh, back in 2010 in Moscow, 700 people a day were dying of heat. And a total of 55,000 people died over that summer from heat. Um, Wallace Wells talks about the wildfires that are occurring, how, how tens of thousands of burned acres are increasing the greenhouse effect, how, uh, you know, add that to the burning of coal for two centuries and the burning of petroleum for 100 years, creating the, the melting of the ice caps and uh, rising sea waters and violent storms. Um, uh, the fact that the earth is getting darker because of less ice, and that's increasing the heating at an exponential rate. Uh, and during this pandemic crisis, one of the facts that uh, is being talked about much more now is that when the ice is melting, there's going to be a release of hundreds of thousands of diseases that have been frozen, which we have no immunities for. So it's this horror story, almost of biblical uh, images, uh, locust storms in West Africa, one recently measured had 192 billion locusts in it. Clouds larger than cities devastating African farmland. Um, with that, you have rising heat and the fact that mosquitoes are going north at about three miles every year with malaria and dengue fever. Um, it's the World Bank estimates that by the year 2030, 3.6 billion more people will be threatened by mosquito-borne diseases. So Wells goes over and over and over these facts. And he's not a climate scientist. He's a researcher. But what he's trying to do in the book is almost stimulate some of this existential dread that is necessary to shock us out of our complacency. Um, I've, I've felt complacent about climate change myself. Um, I don't disagree with the intellectually. But in my heart, sometimes I say, well, it can't be that bad. I minimize it. It's part of my defense mechanism. Um, unfortunately, in America, we have a climate, uh, we have a, a, a fossil fuels industry that pays millions and millions of dollars 
for propaganda, putting out the message that, you know, clean coal is a possibility, for example. Um, and this, these propagandists talk about climate scientists and they label them alarmists or extremists. Uh, they keep talking about climate change as a hoax and their careers are being threatened. And as a result, even the climate scientists in America are stepping back and being more complacent. They're not being as honest with the public. Um, <clears throat> about 30 years ago, I read a book by Jonathan Shell, who talked about what he thought was the reasons why Americans were denying the nuclear threat for nuclear weapons. And he used a term I like called psychic numbing, psychic numbing. And what he said was that it's hard enough to contemplate our own death, our individual death. It's very hard to contemplate the death of all of our friends and loved ones. He said it's nearly impossible to con con conceive of the death of billions of people or of even the human race. And as a result, he says, psychic numbing leaves us unable to act. And we drift towards apathy, isolation, and indifference. Um, another theorist named Tim Morton calls the idea of environmental devastation a hyper object, a hyper object. He said a concept that's so large that we cannot properly comprehend it. And as a result of that, we avert our eyes. We look away. We deny. Um, Wallace Wells goes into other ways that we deny the existential reality that climate change is bringing forward to us. He talks about uh, some people are um, embracing what's called uh, inhumanism or anti-humanism. And it's an attitude of people who believe in near-term human extinction. That's a belief among climate alarmists that uh, uh, within 10, 20, or 30 years, our race will disappear. And the attitude within that community is sort of a stoic form of detachment. Uh, looking at human beings as sort of a cancer on the earth, uh, uh, something not worthy uh, of worrying about. Um, uh, and Wallace Wells talks about that as, uh, at the very best, best, a form of reasonable detachment, but really it's more of a compassionless apathy. Uh, and he criticized it as a, a retreat from politics, uh, uh, sort of uh, a, an inappropriate quietism. Uh, he goes deeper into the psychological dynamics that push us to deny climate change. Um, he talks about the, the, the idea of anchoring. Anchoring is when we hold on to what seems to be um, uh, stable in our lives, like the day-to-day -day continuity of weather. I can look outside every day and it seems roughly the same, so I hold on to that and deny the change that is more long-term. He talks about the ambiguity effect, which is when we look at uncertain data or challenges and use uncertainty to just do nothing at all. Uh, uh, people are often uh, prone to automation bias, which is the belief that um, market forces or technology will automatically solve the problem for us. Uh, he talks about the bystander effect, the bystander effect, which is when we wait for other people to take the first step. Um, and then the last one that I want to focus on, because I think it's the most seductive, is called The Loving Witness. Uh, and it's, uh, it actually came out of a Buddhist uh, reading that I, I did, where it looks at uh, creating an, an attitude uh, of loving witness to the dying earth, as if we were hospice workers for our planet. And that what we should do is the equivalent to what the Dalai Lama says we should do, uh, in contemplating our own mortality, which is to uh, develop compassion and wonderment and love. Um, and in some ways, I do think that that's a, 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 an, a, an appropriate part of my response to my own mortality, to try to live every day with a fuller heart, for example. But that is in itself a sort of uh, abandonment, I think, of our, of what's confronting us because the planet is not like a mortal creature. I mean, we're all going to die in a relatively short st stand, uh, but the planet has the potential for a continuity that we really should be more responsible for. It's not dying 
inevitably, we're causing the biosphere to change in a way that threatens creatures like ourselves. Um, so rather than embrace a sort of futilitarianism, uh, uh, Wallace Wells says we should reclaim our power. He, uh, he sort of talks about approaching the climate as, as I think the existentialists approach our own death. Of course, the sun will explode someday and envelop the planets nearby. But that reality is not something necessarily that we need to allow uh, uh, to collapse us. That our, our insistence on continuing life within our biosphere is a revolt against the essential temporality of life on this earth. So Wallace Wells calls for what he says is both human limitation and human grandiosity. Holding these two elements in conflict with each other is an example of a heroism that he promotes. Um, I, I wanna just close this off because I think the conversation will be more interesting than more of what I have to say. But one of the things that I, I did very early in my teaching career was talk about uh, during the nuclear awareness awakening in the United States, which was really in the early 1970s, when people began to be more conscious of the dangers of nuclear weapons. One of the approaches that was taken was to promote the image of the earth that had become available in, the la in, the, in that time period with the, uh, the, the uh, photographs of the earth from the moon and from satellites, and to look at the fragility of the planet as a way to promote people working in the peace movement. That reality of the image of Earth floating in the blackness of space was an empowering element in my life. So one of the things that I did with my students was I, I urged them to imagine the Earth from space and to imagine how fragile it is and to have that be a parallel to imagining our own fragility and to embrace that fragility in a way to try to promote an acceptance of the fragility at the same time, a rejection of it and a dedication to trying to keep things living. And what I did was I urged my students to meditate on the concept of earth. And um, I would read them some passages of astronauts who had what I call humanistic um, conversion experiences where their own concept of their identity was changed by seeing the fragility of Earth from outer space. So I want to end with a couple of these, um, these images, which I use to try to emphasize the fragility at the same time, promote more advocacy. James Irwin was a astronaut who looked at back at Earth and he said that the Earth reminded him of a Christmas tree ornament that was so fragile and so delicate that if you touched it with your finger, it would crumble and fall apart. I met another astronaut, uh, Rusty Schweikert, who was in Apollo 9. And he, he shared with me a passage that I want to share with you. He said, when you look down on the Earth, you can't imagine how many boundaries and borders you cross again and again and again. And from where you see it, the Earth is a whole and it's so beautiful. There are no frames, there are no boundaries. When you go around the earth in an hour and a half, you begin to realize that your identity is with that whole thing. And that makes a change. Um, a Soviet cosmonaut, Sig Sigmund Jan wrote, before I flew, I already was aware of how small and vulnerable our planet is. But only when I saw it from space in all of its ineffable beauty, did I realize that our planet was so fragile? And then I realized that humankind's most urgent task is to cherish and preserve it. We inherited this biosphere. We come into this life, fragile, mortal creatures. I believe that we have to both accept the mortality of our individual existence, accept the fragility of the planet, and lean into that awareness in a way
that allows us to have a more responsible, meaningful, and inspiring re revolt against those limitations. For those of you who are academic philosophers, I apologize. This was not a systemic argument. It was more of a collection of ideas that I've used in my teaching. And right now I'm wrestling with the idea of trying to tie together these elements of fear and fragility that the pandemic has stirred in people around the world, along with the same sort of uh, sudden realization for many people of how delicate the climate is and how close we are to extinguishing the necessities for life for creatures like ourselves on this planet. And I wanna combine that with this, an existential awareness of our own mortality. So hopefully my Monday, uh, your, your, your Monday has not been made uh, uh, any worse by my dredging up existentialism. Uh, I tend to enjoy it and uh, I hope it meant something to you. Thank you, Robert, for allowing me to, to share.